This is an educational series that intended to, oops. Can you still see the first screen slide okay? Well, big. It's, no. It's Too taking, big. Up, it's yeah. taking up more than the full screen. Okay, there we go. Yes. So this educational series is intended to inform and educate viewers about the art of viewing stone appreciation. And the stone, the Ming B stone here is our sort of logo for our Visana. Now, let's see, oops. At this point, I'd like to ask you to mute your microphones. You can send us questions through the chat box at any time during the program. And we will answer your questions uh, through the chat box or at the end of the program, we'll open it up for discussion. And when we presented it last night, we had a rather lively discussion and I hope we do so again uh, today. Uh, I'll be presenting the program to you today and I'm delighted that you're with me to discuss one of my favorite types of viewing stones. Now, a viewing stone is a natural appearing stone that evokes feelings, has the power to suggest something in nature far greater than the stone itself. A viewing stone stirs the imagination and chrysanthemum flower stones can be beautiful yet intriguing. The chrysanthemum flower stones enjoy great popularity in China, Korea, and Japan, and they're easy to recognize and uh, suggestive of one of the most popular flowers in Asia and one of the most culturally significant flowers. The stones can be beautiful and uh, have played a role in poetry, prose in the Asian literature, and also symbolic of a noble character, vitality, longevity. And in Japan, there were annual ex exhibitions of kiku or chrysanthemum were held at the Imperial Palace in Tokyo for many years. And there were competition among growers, flower growers became popular events. And even today you can go to many of the cities and in the fall, in the autumn, and see wonderful displays of chrysanthemum flowers. The chrysanthemum or kiku was treasured by nobility in the courts and drinking chrysanthemum wine in the fall, autumn, was considered to be a way to live a longer life. And even today, drinking chrysanthemum flower tea is still popular in Japan, China, and uh, in many other countries. Now you'll see the term kiku ishi, which means chrysanthemum stone. And you'll also see in the Western literature, kika seki, or chrysanthemum flower stones. It's referring, both refer to the same uh, type of stone. Ishi is a ja one Japanese word for stone, and seki is another uh, term for a stone. Both are used in the literature and both are referring to this. Well, the chrysanthemum flower stones occur primarily in China, Japan, and Korea. They're also known from Northern California, possibly Northern Italy and the Philippines from examples that I've seen. And I suspect that they'll be found in other uh, locations in South, Southern Asia and in other countries. The, the Chinese stones, as you see, the one on the right, are, tend to be larger. The flower-like mineral formations are bigger and usually white. In Japan, the stones are usually smaller. There's some, often color to them and they're harder, denser. We're not sure why, probably because of tectonic activities over long periods of time. And the Korean stones are probably more similar to, in origin to the Japanese stones than those in China. Now, today we're going to focus on Japanese chrysanthemum flower stones. There are quite an array variety of them in Japan, and 
as I mentioned, they have significant cultural value. The 16 petal chrysanthemum was adopted by the Japanese emperor's crest and seal. So the chrysanthemum flower became the seal for the emperor. The chrysanthemum is a national flower of Japan. And on September 9th of each year, Chrysanthemum Day is celebrated in Japan. So chrysanthemum play a very important role culturally in Japan. And in the fall, you can see wonderful displays of chrysanthemum flowers. The four uh, displays that you see here, each are a single plant. And it's grown for about 14 months to get this kind of shape. And they, they're absolutely gorgeous. The cultivation of the chrysanthemum goes back uh, several hundred years in Japan. It was reaching its peak in the late Edo period, but it's still chrysanthemum breeding is still going on uh, today. Well, the, one of the earliest uh, records of the chrysanthemum stones in Japan is from this book of Japanese products, and it's labeled Kiku Monseki, or literally chrysanthemum pattern stone. And this was in 1877. So we know that chrysanthemum stones have been uh, collected and known and perhaps valued for at least 150 years and probably uh, longer. So what are they? They are literally three-dimensional radiating patterns of mineral crystals that's partially or completely embedded in a sedimentary matrix. Now, they are, you have to realize that they're a combination of a mineral and a, a sedimentary type of deposits or stone. And these are about 250 million years old. They were formed at the interface between the mud bottom of a shallow sea and the water. And it was scientists feel that this was occurred at a time which is very low oxygen levels in the uh, water. The best published articles, scientific articles on these stones are been published by Chinese geologists, researchers. The Japanese stones are less studied. And what happened is that celestite crystals were formed in these low oxygen, oxygen conditions. If there was a nucleus, they formed these radiating patterns that resemble a flower. And so these crystals formations formed first, then sediments uh, were deposited all around them that was compressed event into stone. This, this, all the sediment, sedimentary rock was uplifted, moved over, collided with tectonic plates from India and Northern China, and uh, eventually were discovered. So during this lithification process, the stone forming process, the celestite was slowly replaced by calcite, strontianite, or even quartz. And this happens under heat and pressure. So you'll find in the Japanese chrysanthemum stones, the calcite, strontianite, and celestite, because it's in a slowly, slow progressive uh, process of changing from one form to another. And these are all related minerals. And if you see the, in the upper right, the calcite crystals here look very much like some of those that you see in the chrysanthemum flower stones. Where are they found? In, in Japan, the, most of them are found in Nail Valley above Gifu by this story. I hope you can see the arrow. And about 80 to 85% of the known chrysanthemum flower stones from Japan come from this one region where there's a series of hills or mountains and valleys. Another uh, Shimonita and Okutama stones, they're known from these two localities, they're near Tokyo. 
And then a few stones have been found in the Kama River in uh, Kyoto. And then even fewer are found in Shikoku on the Niyota River, which is here on this island, this, this island of Shikoku. So these are five known sites. There are other reports of chrysanthemum stones being found elsewhere in Japan, but they're either not the same type uh, or they can't be documented. Now, there are many minerals that form flower-like crystals, but the ones we're talking about today are in the family of the calcite, celestite, and strontianite uh, family. The first well-known location for them was Mount Maru, a round mountain, which you can see in this drawing by the famous artist Gokudo. And they were mined, mining was done by hand uh, in, this, in this region. And in the Neo Valley region, this area receives about two or three meters of snowfall every winter. So it's pretty well snowed in uh, in the winter months, but it becomes a thriving summer resort community in the warmer months of the year. Now, in 1940, there was a, a publication, a series of plates published called Kikuishi. And these are typical of the stones that were found back in the 1920s, 1930s, almost 100 years ago. And these are all uh, as found or natural uh, chrysanthemum stones. They haven't been carved or polished as that came in uh, later. Now here is Mount Maru here, Round Mountain, where it became famous for the early production of chrysanthemum flower stones. But another mountain peak like this in Nail Valley, Mount Akura, is famous for producing many fine stones. And so this whole region in Nail Valley has produced, as I said, most of the chrysanthemum flower stones. Formerly, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, there was many mines in this area, maybe as many as 15 or 20 mines. Now there's only a few active mines as there are fewer people collecting these stones in Japan. Dr. Shiraki was a physician who purchased Mount Maru in the late 1920s, early 1930s for the timber. He was planning to harvest the timber but it wasn't easy to get it out. And the manager of, that he had on site told him about these wonderful stones they were finding in, in the rivers and sometimes the exposed outcrops. And he, th these were chrysanthemum flower stones. So he became fascinated by it. He exhibited some of them in Gifu in an expo in 1936. And he presented several of his best ones to the imperial household, to the emperor. Well, the imperial household had geologists study them and report back. And when that happened, the, and people saw these wonderful stones associated with the emperor, they became very popular back in 1950s, 60s, and, and onward. Dr. Shiraki opened a Kikaseki Museum in Gifu for many years. And he also published a journal for nine years called Kiku Ishi. And you can go to the library in Gifu and see copies of that, articles about the chrysanthemum stones. Here he is showing a chrysanthemum flower stone to Toy Sato, who is a stone collector in Southern California. When Toy Sato, Mrs. Sato got back to uh, Los Angeles, she helped arrange the first major exhibition of chrysanthemum flowers in North America that I know of. It was held at the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum in 1973. 
and 38 natural and polished chrysanthemum flower stones from Japan were exhibited, along with a number of other stones. It was the Jibu Aiseki Association that brought these over, the one that she was associated with. So we got our first exposure in the United States to them uh, roughly 50 years ago. Also, uh, they gained prominence during the US bicentennial 1976, when the Japanese government presented this large uh, Nail Valley polished stone to President Gerald Ford. Actually, the Japanese government presented two chrysanthemum flower stones to the US to commemorate the bicentennial of our country. One was polished, one was uh, unpolished or natural. And these were part of six stones presented at that, in that time. These two stones that I'm show, just showing you now and the previous one reside at the National Bonsai and Punjing Museum in Washington, DC. And they're occasionally on exhibit there. Well, chrysanthemum stones in Japan fall into two major categories. One is stones as they are found in nature, natural stones. They refer to them as Saba, S-A-B-A. -A. Then the other are the polished stones, uh, as you see on the right, where part of it has been, part of the matrix has been cut, chipped away to reveal the mineral formations embedded in the rock. So we're gonna take a look now at uh, some examples of the polished stones first, and then we'll look at some of the natural Saba stones. Now up in Tarumi in Nail Valley, the local government has established a chrysanthemum stone museum. This is also a location where you find very old flowering cherry trees right across from this museum is estimated to be a 2000 year old flowering cherry tree. And so people come up to the, this valley in the early spring to see the cherry trees in flower, the old cherry trees and to visit the museum. The fellow here, here and here is Mr. Ishihara who was an early collector of the chrysanthemum stones and uh, carved and polished many of them. He helped establish this museum. It's, it's still uh, in existence today. The name has changed to the Motosushi Sakura Museum. And it's open every day from late March to early April during the cherry blossom, during the cherry trees flowering time. And then it's open on the weekends throughout the rest of the spring and summer. Well, inside the museum are many large uh, examples, large sized examples of the chrysanthemum flower stones. Some of them have the very large flowers as you see in the upper left, uh, others with smaller size flowers. The size of the flower probably reflects the time the crystals were growing during the ideal environmental time. And when I asked the scientists who studying chrysanthemum flower stones in China, how long did it take to produce these rays? They said literally several million years. I was thinking maybe they were formed in weeks or months because when I was a child, I had this little crystal set that I put in water and the crystals formed immediately. Well, this is not the case with chrysanthemum flower stones. We're looking at stones that are literally millions of years old and took millions of years to form. In the town of Tanigumi, which is up in Nail Valley, there are at least two, maybe three shops that sell chrysanthemum stones that are mined locally. Most of them have been polished. And I'll get to the reason why the polishing stones is so common. But you can see, find a wonderful array of stones here in this uh, village. This particular stone, fairly large stone, is from Hatsuga Dani or Hatsuga Valley, 
<clears throat> it's a different from Round Mountain and uh, the Akasuka Mountain. <clears throat> and if you're familiar with the Nail Valley and the different mines, you can usually tell which stone came from which mine. But today there's probably not a handful of people that can do that. This particular stone was polished in 1975 and has many of the small white calcite formations embedded throughout this uh, stone. The, uh, mining operations in the 1970s were largely by hand, some equipment was used, and they look for a seam, as you can see here and here. This was a, a seam of rock that was sort of greenish color, uh, a greenish black color. They called it Schauschist, a German term for this particular form formation. And it's only in this lens that you find the chrysanthemum flower-like mineral deposits. Here is a stone that's been removed out of the rock and is will be taken down and examined to see what type of uh, flowers are in it. These pictures are from a book, Chrysanthemum Stones and Peacock Stones, published 1974. Well, after the stones are mined, they look like this. This is not what you see in the shops, <clears throat> these beautiful uh, exposed mineral formations. This is what you see in nature, stones that look like this. And if you look at this stone, we'd say, oh, this is a great chrysanthemum flower stone. You would probably say, no, are you kidding? But it is a chrysanthemum flower stone because the mineral formations are embedded within this stone. They're not all right at the surface. And so cutting and removing part of the matrix stone is essential if you're going to see the beauty inside these stones. So the process is to use a saw and make these uh, parallel cuts on the stone, use a cold chisel, chip it away until you begin to expose the mineral formations. Once you've done that, you take a grinder and smooth it out. And the idea behind this is just to remove enough and polish enough to expose the mineral formations that resemble a flower. Now you're not, you shouldn't remove the, change the shape of the stone. Yeah. The layer that the stone mineral formations occur in is fairly distinct, as you can see in this particular stone. Here are where the type of stone that contains the flower or is fused with another type of stone adjacent to it. It was probably heat and pressure in the past that caused this uh, fusion. So it's you have to know uh, where to look for this stone and what type of matrix to look for in order to find them. Now, is this a great chrysanthemum flower stone or is it just a typical Japanese landscape stone that holds a little water pool stone? So here's the, what many people think of as Japanese suiseki. And here is uh, another form of Japanese suiseki here. Actually, this is the same stone. This is the back side of it, and this is the front side. And the one side has been worked or enhanced to expose the formations, while the back has been left completely natural. Now, when you're up in Nail Valley in the rivers or, or long seams that have been exposed, how can you tell this is a chrysanthemum flower? It takes experience and practice uh, in order to identify it. You look for the little calcite deposits in it. So how do people evaluate chrysanthemum flower stones? One has a stone. We've got some noise coming up from somebody. Uh, retain the original shape of the stone. 
expose only one side of it. You look for flowers that have a well-defined disc and well-defined rays coming out of it. Good contrast between the background stone matrix and the, the flowers themselves and the distribution of flowers in the stone. If you have a chrysanthemum flower stone with all of these features, you have a valuable, truly valuable and beautiful chrysanthemum flowers. And relatively few of them will have this kind of, will meet all of these criteria. This one is one of the exceptions to the rule in which both sides have been polished. This is a large stone, weighs about 75 or 80 pounds and has literally hundreds of uh, these mineral-like flower formations on the front and back side of it. And it's a dark red matrix to it. Some of the flowers are relatively large. Others are small, depending upon the growth of the mineral uh, formations. And you can see this is a fairly large stone. Now, I mentioned that most come from Nao Valley. This one comes from, these two come from Okutama, which is near Tokyo. And they have, uh, they, you don't find much color in these. The rays are very narrow. And in this larger stone, this formation here, the three-dimensional crystals are coming towards you. They're cut in cross-section. So you're looking at a cross-section of those rays of the flower. Here's one that's sort of in a, uh, a sideways cut to it, transverse cut. And you can see some of the length of the petals here. So knowing how to cut stones to expose it is critical to having a good uh, chrysanthemum flower stones. If people didn't cut and polish these stones, you would lose about three fourths of the known chrysanthemum flowers that are in collections. There would just be a very small number of stones present. This is from Shikoku Island, the Neota River. I've only seen maybe a dozen stones from this locality. So in terms of scarcity, these are certainly meet that criteria. The stone on the left, uh, Toy Sato, Mrs. Sato, I think got this from Dr. Shiraki, brought it to California, held it for many years and it passed to another collector. And then eventually it ended up in our collection uh, here in Claremont. So this is the rarest form of in localities. <clears throat> now there's another type of chrysanthemum flower stone that's known as the peacock chrysanthemum flower. And this is when the flower form mineral formations occur in an adjoining rock layer from that uh, original layer they occur in. Here is the one you can see here, the dark uniform color. And then this type of stone, which I can't tell you a lot about it, has all of this diversity and color in it. And the, the Japanese stone collectors refer to this as a peacock stone. Here's another example of it. This is the front part of the stone that's been polished. And here are the chrysanthemum flowers near the base. And this is the backside of it. This is the natural as you find it once you've taken it out of the mind, washed it off, it would have this dull color, duller color to it. And then this is the layer here with the chrysanthemum flowers. So this is nice to appreciate and, and enjoy both ways. Now, you also find if you visit shops and sometimes look on eBay, you'll find stones that look like this. And these are true chrysanthemum flower stones. But what has happened is that they've taken a diamond drill and they've removed that background stone or matrix from it here and here, all around this stone so that the stone stands out. It has more of a three-dimensional aspect to it. You see that also here where these nice smooth edges, 
see this? These smooth edges indicate that somebody has taken a diamond drill and removed some of the matrix stones to work it, enhance it. Now, serious stone collectors, Suiseki collectors or Jewing stone connoisseurs are, don't look on these very kindly because they consider them to be overworked. They're more of a uh, tourist item or just for people that like pretty things. But in a Jewing stone connoisseurship, this would not, it would lower the value of the stone to have one like this. Now let's look at two stones. Here's another one, a large stone that's been worked so there's been some carving done to make the flowers stand out. And here's one where it hasn't been. The natural stones will have a ragged edge to it, not a nice smooth edge that you see here. So it's an e they're easy to tell apart, uh, the ones that have been enhanced uh, to an extreme. Now the natural stones, were shipped over to natural stone. They can be found in streams uh, high up in Nail Valley. As the streams cut through the mountains, they will cut through these layers bearing the chrysanthemum stones. They will fall out into the river. And then with the snow melt in the spring, they get tumbled and rolled down the, the stream. Here you can see the, where the, some of the flowers, the chrysanthemum stone formations are found mineral formations in this layers here. So you can find them in the streams, uh, but you have to know what to look for. The streams like this are a little bit larger. There's a number of streams up there coming out of the mountains. And if you look carefully, you can find uh, chrysanthemum flower stones. Now, I should mention that people live in Nail Valley, go up there and look for these stones regularly. So don't think you can just fly over, run up there and find the big, beautiful chrysanthemum stones because they're already be in people's collections. Many of those chrysanthemum stones look like this, just a sort of semi-rounded ball. And these are called chrysanthemum ball stones. If you take these stones and cut them in half, you can find beautiful chrysanthemum flower-like mineral formations. And we've done this, we've sat and maybe cut 15 or 20 ball stones to look at, to expose this. You can cut this stone several ways, several in several sections, like a loaf of bread. And you can see the, the chrysanthemum flower formations throughout. The stone on the right is much bigger. This is about the size of a soccer ball. And here you can see the mineral formations. This stone has not been polished. It's called a natural river wash stone or Kawazura Kikaseki. Kawazura means river washed. Kika is chrysanthemum flower and seki stone. So this is a natural stone. And if you're into more serious Japanese style stone appreciation, this will have considerable value because it's a more subtle beauty and not the very uh, bright in your face type of flowers, uh, bouquet of flowers. Another type of Kawazuri stone uh, is this one with two fairly large mineral formations that resemble the chrysanthemum stone flower here and here against a dark uh, multicolored background. This too is about the size of a soccer ball. And uh, I like this stone very much. We were in Nail Valley many years ago collecting and we met a Buddhist monk who was a stone collector and he presented me with this stone. And it's one of the prized ones in our collection. And if you try to practice Japanese style of stone aesthetics, you know that a subtle beauty and understated beauty are important. And so this stone would certainly fit into that understated beauty concept. This is a small uh, Kawazuri or river wash stone that was found in the 1930s. Uh, it belonged to Dr. Shiraki. It was sold to a nurseryman. 
who had a very narrow base made for it here. And he said, this stone looks like a lady dressed in a kimono with arms sticking out. And you can see the arms sticking out here and the kimono hanging from it, exposing all the chrysanthemum flowers. And he was also familiar with no plays. And there's said this resembles a female character in the legend and one of the no plays. So he's just tying this stone to a traditional Japanese culture or play. And then had a base made for it. And this large block resembles the stage of a no play. So here we have the just a stone, small stone that conveys the feeling or impression of an actor, no actor on a stage. And this is what viewing stone and Suiseki is all about. This was reportedly so this particular stone base and uh, display slab was reportedly sold for over $700,000 back um, over, let's see, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Now we don't know if that's true, but it's certainly sold for a very high price. Uh, it's one of the prized chrysanthemum flower stones in Japan. Well, how big are these stones? And how small are they? They range in size from this one, which is about the size of a ping pong ball with a natural single flower shown with a penny here. And then we saw this large stone in a Shinto shrine in Issei. And as you can see here, it's, it's a little over five feet high, about a meter and a half high, and a little over a meter wide, with very large, I, th these are the largest mineral formations that I've seen in a Japanese stone. And the, the Shinto priest here. Now, there, there are a few mining operations going on today. Uh, I know of at least two. They're using modern excavation equipment to ex cut through, to expose those layers. And here he's found a stone. The next uh, six slides, six picture photographs, three frames are from Christopher Hertz, Hertz uh, in France, who is a, a collector of chrysanthemum stones. And here you can see this uh, mineral-like formation embedded in the rock in the side of the mountain. They cut these out and then uh, make them available to collectors. These are two excellent ones that in uh, Christoph's collection, these two have a reddish color to them. The reddish color probably comes from the deposition of iron in the absence of oxygen. If oxygen is present, then it will oxidize with the iron and you'll get rust, tan or brown colors. And then here's another natural Saba stone, three-dimensional one with a little bit of, of uh, tan color in it. Both of these are outstanding Nail Valley stones. Two others, the one on the right is about the, it's bigger than a, slightly bigger than a softball, uh, beautiful formations without a variety of color. The other one on the side, on the left, the size of a baseball has this reddish color in. This stone was owned by Dr. Shiraki collected in the 1930s, and then passed to a, another stone collector and dealer in Tokyo. And then we got it from him uh, a number of years ago. Stones like this are the most valuable or more valuable or more expensive than the polished stones, usually two or three times as much. This is one of the best known uh, natural chrysanthemum flower stones in Japan. It's been exhibited many times in national exhibitions and has had several owners and it's absolutely gorgeous. And again, you can see how the ragged edge to the rays coming out gives you, tells you that this is natural. It hasn't been carved, manipulated. <clears throat> 
Other types, this is a also a natural stone found in, I don't know if this came out of a mine or a river, but it has very tiny flowers with very short rays to them embedded in this, as opposed to the this larger stone with the calcite crystals completely, almost completely surrounded, embedded in it. And these type, both types of stones are prized because they are considered to have more subtle beauty. These two natural stones were displayed in 2020, the Japanese Suiseki ex exhibition at the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. And there are beautiful examples of uh, natural Saba chrysanthemum stones. And it's up to the viewer which one appeals to you more. But they both are considered to be exceptional. Now, I mentioned another site called Shimonita, which is not too far from Tokyo. In, uh, and these stones are easily to identify from this area because they're very narrow rays, oops, very narrow rays, and they have a bluish green color. And I've only seen them in the natural condition. I've never seen these polished. I think because they will break up, uh, they won't hold up. I like this particular stone because it has movement. It looks like it's rising up, could be a shooting star. Uh, there are many ways to interpret this uh, particular stone. The next one, also one that's also in our collection is called Turning Lion. It was named that by a previous owner. Again, you can see the narrow rays coming down here, bluish green color. And he gave it the name Turning Lion because he thought it looked like the lion's head of, of the mature male lion, the mane uh, coming back, flowing back. And this is another aspect of the beauty of Suiseki and, and Japanese stones is that you can take what you see in it, assign a poetic name to it to help convey the message of the stone. There's two more examples of the Shimonita type of stone. These are re relatively rare. You don't see them in outside of Japan very often. Then Okutama, a natural Okutama stone. You have a cavity in this stone or pocket and this mineral formation has formed inside of here. Now, I don't know if the rock, in this particular case, if the rock was formed first and then the mineral deposit formed later, or if the mineral deposit was formed first and then the rock just was formed around it. Now, in some cases, you will find stones, chrysanthemum flyer stones, that are losing or have lost their mineral deposits. This flower or uh, flower like deposit right, went all the way from here over to, oops, from here to here. It's a very large flower, but it's probably lost maybe 75% of the calcite mineral. And so you have a partial cast of the, of the stone. In this next example, <clears throat> there's very little of the mineral left because here's the outline of where it once occurred. This is about eight, eight inches across, about, about almost 20 centimeters from here to here. It's a large stone. But all you have now is the cast of the uh, chrysanthemum flower. And these are known as nuke saba. Nuke refers to something's lost, something's gone. And in this case, it's referred to the, the mineral. And these are another rare type of form of the chrysanthemum stone flowers that some people like and enjoy because it, it reminds them of the Japanese aesthetic of Fleeting beauty is once the beauty was there, but now it's gone, it's lost. And you can look at that stone in, in that manner and appreciate, uh, appreciate it. 
Another example of a Sabinuki or Nuke Saba stone that has lost all of the minerals that were once deposited here. And you only have the cast of that chrysanthemum flower stone. And again, this is people that like the subtle beauty, more unrestrained type of uh, beauty will be attracted to these stones. They're very rare. You don't see them often. And it's essentially a, just a cast of the mineral deposit. Well, when do you display chrysanthemum stones? You can display them anytime in your home. If you're going to display them in a formal tokonoma, or, uh, which is an alcove in a Japanese home used to display art, that art could be a sc hanging scroll, could be a flower arrangement, it could be a ceramic vase, a bonsai or a stone. It's typically done in the fall because that's when the chrysanthemum flowers are in bloom and the seasonal aspects of a tokonoma are very important. Most of the chrysanthemum flower stones are held and oriented in a wooden base, hand carved wooden base known as a daiza in Japan. And the polished stones should always be displayed in a daiza or wooden base like this. You don't put a polished stone in a tray with sand uh, according to the traditional ways of display in Japan. Now, this is a natural Saba stone, one of my favorite stones that I've displayed in the ceramic tray with sand. This is acceptable. We've seen this in a number of exhibits in Japan and um, it fits with the tradition. Now, when you look at a stone, you have to look at it carefully because it may not appear very attractive on one side, but as you look at it carefully and turn it over, you can see the, the occasionally the mineral formations that resemble the chrysanthemum flower in Japanese stones. So the chrysanthemum flowers are really, truly natural treasures in the geological history of the earth. And this very subtle flower in this horizontally oriented stone is one that I can keep on my desk and look at from time to time and enjoy immensely. So what type of stone should you collect if you're gonna acquire a, a chrysanthemum stone from Japan? It depends upon you and what appeals to you and what the stone says to you. It can be completely natural like this one with this very quiet, subtle uh, chrysanthemum flower down here and another one like it on the other side. Or it can be one of the polished stones that are brighter, more cheerful. Depends on your experience, your knowledge and what appeals to you. So I'll end the presentation today with one of my uh, poems that I like. Oh, biting frost, fall as much as you please. There's no flower after chrysanthemum. And in Japan, the chrysanthemum, many people consider <clears throat> the chrysanthemums uh, autumn flowering to be the last of the significant plants that they treasure. And so it's a <clears throat> indication that winter's coming and we'll have to wait to spring for the next blooming season. If you want more information on Japanese chrysanthemum stones, I refer you to our website. There are articles in and the feature articles on Japanese chrysanthemum flower stones as well as the Chinese. Or if you read uh, Japanese, this www.kikaseki is produced by Mr. Ishihara, the author of this book, <clears throat> The World of Chrysanthemum Flower Stone. He's a friend of ours, and we've been to Nail Valley a couple of times with him. And also we have the English language book on chrysanthemum stones that Hiromi Nakaoji, my wife and I produced a few years ago. And it's available on our website. I want to thank Hiromi for all of her work over the years 
as we search for information about these stones. There was very little information in English when we started, <clears throat> and we had to travel from north to south and east to west in Japan, meeting with private collectors, going to libraries, and unearthing the material in that book. Well, now I'm going to stop my presentation. You can unmute your microphones, and we can open it up to questions. <clears throat>